lovely to be here with you. I bring greetings from Quainton Baptist and they send their love to you. That's something we need right now, isn't it? In that last verse, his truth at all times firmly stood and shall from age to age endure. And what an age we live in at the moment where we can't be sure of truth anymore. Uh, other than, of course, the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ and that solid rock and the truth that's contained in the Bible. We can't trust anybody else. Time has shown us that. If Matthew chapter 6 and then verse 25. This is all Jesus' own words. It's quoting the Lord Jesus Christ when he was speaking. Starting at verse 25 then. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them, are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. A well-known passage. And that last line rings so true, doesn't it? Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. We'll be coming back to look at this passage um, in overview. And we'll also be looking at another passage uh, a little bit later as well. If you happen to still have your Bible open at Matthew 6, that's handy because it's in Matthew 7. But if your Bible's closed, you can open it again and look in Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to read um, from verse 15 on again. This uh, is a familiar passage. Um, and I trust uh, for all of us that there are many familiar Bible passages that uh, we can bring to mind uh, and that resonate with us. And yet some tend to stick just a bit more than others sometimes, don't they? So it's Matthew chapter 7. And I would like us to read from verses 15 all the way down to the end of the chapter, which is 29. I'll, I'll read and please follow along. And the heading in the Bible I'm reading from for this first section is false and true teachers. <coughs> Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast in the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. 
Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these, th these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Now we've read a couple of um, passages from Matthew, and those passages were absolutely packed with goodness, like any scripture, really. You only start reading and you just see so much goodness uh, and uh, truth in them. But what I want to do is, rather than diving in too deep, I would just like to pick up some themes under this heading. And that is, we don't need to worry, but we do need to be careful. I'll say that again, the title, we don't need to worry, but we do need to be careful. And if you think back to those passages, Matthew 6, was really the theme is not worrying there, isn't it? And then the part that we looked at in Matthew 7 is about being a little bit careful in the age in which we're living. So let's come back and start thinking about these passages. And have you noticed that we're living in very strange times? Very strange times. Not so long ago, um, was it uh, a couple of weeks ago, that the uh, black and white horse, uh, black and white horses were loose in London running about? Did you see that? I think it would have been very hard not to see it because somehow it found its way all over the media, didn't it? You couldn't turn uh, your head without seeing a video of these horses running about. And of course, the white one had a lot of red on it. Now, I don't know whether that was blood or not. Um, it looked a bit suspicious to me. And, of course, it drew a lot of people talking about the horsemen of the apocalypse and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and people started thinking about that white horse as being the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's not, is it? When we look in the book of the Revelation and we see those four horsemen... We know that that first one, the rider of the white horse or the pale horse, is not the Lord Jesus because of all the terrible things that happen afterwards. <laughs> Jesus comes along in Revelation chapter 19, doesn't he? On a white horse. His name is Faithful and True. And that's uh, something for us to think about. But do you know, on the same day that the horses were running about, maybe you heard this as well, that the Westminster clock, those the clock faces, uh, attached to the Houses of Parliament. People call them Big Ben, but you probably know that actually it's the bell inside that's called Big Ben, not the whole tower or the, or the whole clock. I don't know whether you saw this, but it stopped at nine o'clock. Two of the faces just stopped working at nine o'clock. Then at 10.06, Big Ben dinged 11 times. So you got 9.11 on the same day that these horses were loose running about it's a, it's a bit of a weird thing and I, you know I'm, I'm not here to read too many things into it but what I would say is that a lot of the positions and the institutions that we thought we could trust we find that at best they're a bit corrupt and at worst they're out for us and I'm thinking of institutions like the police and the health service. Now, I don't, uh, I'm not here to denigrate them all. I'm sure there's some wonderful people in the health service, but, you know, they've got euthanasia pathways. They've got all sorts of uh, grim things going on. 
uh, the same in the police. I'm sure there's some good people in the police. However, you know, they're more likely to come chasing you for some hate crime if you said the wrong thing than they are to do anything if your car gets nicked or, you know, you know the kind of thing that I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the erosion and the decay of the institutions around us which we used to think that we could trust. And so if we are keeping an eye on biblical prophecy, we're seeing things... When I was thinking about this, I, was, I wrote down we're seeing things fall into place. And yet they're not falling into place. They're getting carefully arranged into place by people. People who perhaps don't even understand what they're doing is part of this. But God is allowing it to happen because God's purposes are getting worked out. Now, can you imagine when John was writing down the words of Revelation 13, 16 to 18, he causeth all, small and, uh, sorry, rich and poor, small and great, bond and free, to receive that mark. And they can't buy or sell without that mark. I'm sure that John and, and the writers of lots of other scripture would have had absolutely no idea of the ultimate fulfillment of that. Now, as we know in the Bible, there are some passages where there are multiple fulfillments of prophecy. But that ultimate fulfillment of Revelation 13 to 16, did John ever envisage artificial intelligence or big data or the ubiquitousness of internet connectivity? A few years ago, I used to think, goodness me, what wonderful charities these are trying to roll out the internet in Africa. That's really nice. And then I became... Uh, more aware and understood that this is part of the control grid. It's not to help people at all, it's to enslave them and entrap them. And so I came to understand that. And so these things that are happening, the technology that's getting rolled out, is all part of what we can read about in the end times of the scripture. And on the one hand, I think it's amazing that it demonstrates the veracity of scripture. Things that were written thousands of years ago, of course, by God, even though they had human uh, writers, are now coming into sharp focus. But at the same time, it also shows me about the wiles of the devil and the demonic realm, and that some of the people who are doing these bad things have been doing it for generations in the same family. So it, it goes beyond the lifespan of a single human being. And so I can see a, a demonic side to that as well, because in the normal realm of things, would, would you be gripped to do something that goes you know, beyond the span of your life, unless you were driven by some other power? So all of the evil that the, we read about in the Bible is being made manifest. And of course, we've got the situation in Israel, and just recently, uh, there was Passover there. So there's all sorts of different things going on. And what I would like to do is just go back to that passage in Matthew chapter 6 and just pick up a few notes. This is not an exhaustive study. This is just picking up a few things in there. So Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25. And Jesus starts off by saying, therefore... I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? And so the first thing I wanted to point out is the base nature of what Jesus is talking about. He's going right down to the very bottom level things, isn't he? The fundamental things, food and drink and clothing. It doesn't say, take no thought for what car ye shall drive, or what house ye shall live in, or what holidays ye shall go on. It's at this very, very basic level. So our absolute basic needs are met by the uh, goodness of God. And we read elsewhere in the scripture, don't we, that the Lord shall supply all of our needs, not our greeds or our wants, but all of our needs. Then we come on to verse 26, where it says, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor do they gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? And really, all I wanted to do was uh, pull out of this verse that phrase at the bottom, 
are ye not much better than they? The Heavenly Father looks after everything and everybody. But he's talked about the birds of the air. But after he's talked about the birds or the fowls of the air, we actually get a pecking order. In that, are we not much better than they? Now, you've probably met people that over pamper their dogs and treat their dogs like little humans. And of course, you know, animals are also a creation of the Lord and I'm uh, not belittling the role that they play. They can be very soothing and very calming for people and very therapeutic. However, what we need to remember is we're better than them. They're not to be put on a pedestal. The Lord has put things in order. And when people go in that direction, the danger is that they start worshiping the creation rather than the creator. And of course, we, we read about that elsewhere in scripture. Verse 27, which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And this highlights for us the futility of worry. When we worry about things, we're really not taking God at his word. God tells us we don't need to worry. Hebrews 13, 5. He'll never leave us or forsake us. But in our humanity, that's what we tend to do, isn't it? When bad things happen, we start uh, worrying rather than turning straight to the Lord. And in fact, the next thing we read, it says, Why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these those verses that we read down there culminate in verse 31 therefore take no thought saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed so not only as Jesus highlighted the futility of worry but then he said take no thought you know don't do it don't spend time worrying about things because that it's not going to do anything for you none of us can change uh, can um, add one cubit to our stature by taking thought about these things and it finishes that section finishes verse 32 for after all these things do the gentiles seek for your heavenly father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Fatherly, he tends and spares us. Well, our feeble frame he knows. And I'm sure you know other words from that hymn as well. The Lord is looking after us. So what are we to do? Well, we're certainly not to spend time on worrying because all of our needs will be taken care of. And there are certain things that when we look around the world, could worry us, but we can't really change anything about them. We can definitely remember them in prayer and we can bring them before the Lord, but we should not be exercising ourselves overly with these things. In, in a way, if you're saved, you're more like a spectator to world events. You can look at them without worrying about them because you know that the Lord has your future in his hands. But here's the, the golden nugget, if you like, Verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And look what it says next. And all these things, so that's all the things that we've just been considering. Food, drink and raiment, what you're, the clothes you're going to wear. All these things shall be added unto you. Take no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. That's so reassuring, isn't it? In these difficult times that the Lord has everything in his hands and he will bring us through. It's him that decides how long we spend here. It's him that decides uh, everything. Of course, we do have our own free will. And we need to be in the business, and I speak to myself here very much, we need to be in the business of feeding the spirit instead of feeding the flesh and to have a closer walk with the Lord. But he has everything in his hands. And so the summary, really, of that passage is don't worry. We don't need to worry. 
And if we spend time worrying, then really we're not taking the Lord at his word in that he'll provide for us. But at the same time, we do need to be careful. And if we turn over now to Matthew 7 and just revisit that other passage we read, from verse 15 it said, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. So now if you're wondering where that phrase that we often use about a wolf in sheep's clothing comes from, there it is. Verse 15, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. The reason I highlight this is that we need the spiritual gift of discernment. Now, of course, it's always been needed, but I think it would be fair to say it might be needed more now than it's ever been needed because so many people and so many things are in the uh, realm of deception. Now, there's all sorts of people on the TV, on the radio, on YouTube. So the same place where people can watch messages from Chartridge, they can also watch all sorts of other things. And there are many people that profess to be Christians. In fact, I don't know whether you saw it, and maybe you don't even know the name, but there's a very famous guy in the media world called Russell Brand, who has recently been baptised. Now, if that's genuine, that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? That's a really great thing if he's genuinely following the Lord Jesus Christ. However, we need to be very, very careful because we read that in those last days, there's going to be deception. There's going to be all sorts of different things happening. Let's carry on reading. Ye shall know them by their fruits. That, that's another thing that I find. There are several people that I've watched on YouTube who identify themselves as Christians. They'll say things like, as a Christian, I think this. Or as a Christian, I'm very surprised by that. But as a Christian myself, I'm very surprised by the language some of these people use and the metaphors they use and some of the things they say. And I think, well, if you're trying to honour the Lord, why would you even say words like that? So sometimes it's very easy to spot. And yet, actually, the worst thing uh, in the world of deception is when the deception is subtle where it looks like the right thing but actually it's the wrong thing now if we had some Jehovah's Witnesses here and we compared notes with them we'd probably agree on 85 or 90 percent of things with them but there's some very very important things that we wouldn't agree on quite a few important things actually and of course the obvious one that I'm sure we we've all come across in talking to more talking to other people is they don't believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is God that's a, a difficulty but there's all sorts of other deceptions built on top of that for instance I happen to know that they do believe that first horseman of the four horsemen is Jesus so they sort of and that that actually confirms um what we read in 2 Corinthians, I think it's 11 or 12, where it says, if somebody comes to you bringing another Jesus, it's quite possible to get hold of the wrong Jesus. And that's exactly what the Jehovah's Witnesses have done. They got the wrong one. Um, and there's lots of other things as well. In, in fact, in a discussion with my, my daughter landed me in, in a Zoom call with some Jehovah's Witnesses um, a couple of years ago. And one of the things that came out is they do not believe in the omnipresence of God which, again, I thought was a surprising thing, because there's all sorts of scriptures to show us that God can be anywhere or is everywhere. Um, anyway, that, that's uh, beside the point. Let me carry on reading here. He shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast in the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Now, if we look at our own lives and look at our fruits and we're unhappy with our fruits, here's what we can't do. We can't change that in our own strength. We can't say tomorrow, I'm going to work harder and do uh, do more good and bring forth more good fruits. Now, we have a role to play in it, of course, but what we need to do is go to our Father in heaven and say, help me draw closer to you. And as a result of that, we will bring forth good fruits. The, the, the cure is always the connection with the Lord. We can't force things in the flesh. 
And here's a very, very sobering passage now that we read in verses 21, 22 and 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Now when you read that particular passage, I can't help thinking of some of these TV evangelists and people that are very public and they're healing people and casting out devils. You even find it on places like Aylesbury High Street these days that churches come out and have healing ministries. And of course we know that God can heal. There's no doubt about that at all. God can definitely do that. But whether he is in that ministry or not is something that we need to discern because when people major on this and focus on these things then we have to ask ourselves well it's it's in that last um part of the sentence and in thy name done many wonderful works so the claim is we've done works and of course we know that the gospel is not works based we're not saved by works we're saved through grace of course we need works as well, because you're, you'll show your faith through those works. But it's a very dangerous thing when people make a claim that their, their godliness, their um, connection to God is because they did these things. We cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works. Verse 23 is very telling. Let us now just as we close, look at this very, very well-known passage that comes next towards the end of Matthew chapter 7. Uh, I'm sure that many of us sung choruses about this when we young, were younger in Sunday school. You know, the wise man, the wise man built his house upon the rock. Do you remember that one? Uh, so we were, were taught these things and it's, uh, it's an important uh, point, but we need to be careful. We need to be discerning. We've just been reading about false teachers and false profession in the preceding verses. And then Jesus comes along with this parable of the two builders and the two foundations. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon the house. And that's sure to happen in our lives, isn't it? In our lives, the rain will come. The wind will beat upon the house of our lives. The floods will come. The difficulties will arise. And yet, look what happened. In this particular case, it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And of course, the the meaning is absolutely obvious, isn't it, to us all, that if we build our lives on the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ, then whatever comes our way, uh, the storms of life, the different adversities that are part of the human condition, it seems, will not um, cause that house to fall because it's built upon that rock. Verse 26, And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and look what happened well it's very simple it fell and great was the fall of it it wasn't built on sure foundations was it it wasn't built on the rock of the lord jesus christ and so when the times came that were difficult when the going got tough then it fell now, when it came to pass, sorry, and it came to pass, when Jesus has ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. That's interesting, isn't it? Because these people, these other people that were claiming um, to have knowledge, the scribes, well, they didn't have that same level of authority. And of course, it, it's easy for us as we read this to know why. It's because Jesus was talking about himself. You know, he is the word. And so, as he expounded it, 
you know, when we talk about ourselves, we can talk with authenticity, can't we? Nobody can talk about Andy Burton with quite the knowledge that Andy Burton can. And it's the same for each of us. You know, other people might know us, but they don't know us quite as well as we know ourselves. And so we can speak with authority. And in this case, Jesus had that amazing authority. Not only is he the son of God, co-equal with God, but he is the word of God. And he was talking about himself. So while it's interesting to see what's happening in the world, and I think we should keep an eye out, you know, we're... we're um, What's the word I'm looking for? We're commended to be watchmen, aren't we? To keep a lookout about what's going on. Um, we have that passage about uh, the thief in the night. But then the next part says, but brothers, you're not in darkness. So we're commended to be on the lookout. And it's interesting to see what's going on. But we don't need to worry. Because as far as our personal lives are concerned and the things that are happening in and around them, we know that all things work together for good for those that love the Lord. And I'm sure you could quote the rest of Romans 8.28. But we do need to be careful. And more than anything else, we need to exercise that spiritual gift of discernment. One of many gifts that we read about and we get in the spirit. May the Lord bless those thoughts to us. And may we not worry about what we see going on, but may we be careful and discerning as we observe. <laughs>